Thank you, Jesus. According to Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be one, called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end, and upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, for, even forever, the zeal of the Lord, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. When the angel revealed himself, to Zechariah and began to tell him of things were about to come and what was to take place, that he was to have a son. And then when the angel came to Mary and began to speak to her about what was to be, that she were to bear a son, It was with zeal. When the angels, when the angel shone before the shepherds in the field, it was with zeal. And when the hosts were, and the heavenly, uh, heavens were open for them to see, and the heavenly hosts were there, the Lord's armies were singing unto, unto peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Glory in the highest. It was with zeal. A such a zeal that would be fervent, hot, to boiling over. Because they knew what was about to come. That mankind would receive salvation. That Israel would receive salvation. And would be delivered from their captives. So they may be free to live in and with God. And to become his. And he theirs. But here, I'm going to read this again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, period. Pause. There's a brief pause right there. And it's the age of dispensation of grace. Grace. Yes, he's received. Each of us are being added to the government of the kingdom of heaven. But when the, when the complete fulfillment of this is to take place, when the, the government shall be upon his shoulders and he rules over the entire earth, that is when, when, when fulfillment comes and he comes back. And he sets everything in order. But right now we're in an age of dispensation of grace where grace is being poured out for people to be saved, to come into a relationship. The reason why he has not come back is because Father is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. The precious fruit of the earth are those, his people that he has created. He's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. He's waiting for those that are full of the Spirit of God that would go forth and preach the gospel, being instant season and out of season, burning with the message of truth. And I want you to see this. 
No, it's, it's grace to live in righteousness. It's grace to live in holiness. And you're going to see the, the depth of this. The purpose. I wanted to take this beyond just the baby in the manger. I wanted you to see the depth of it, the power of it. And I pray that each one of you, your hearts are opened and that the fire of God, the Spirit of God would burn within you and that there would be a greater revelation and understanding of who Jesus really is and what He has really done. Because each one of us, whether we're mature in the things of God or we're fresh newborn babies and just got slapped on our little bit behindies. <laughs> that you can come to know him and have a relationship and encounter with him and he can be revealed even more to you, his truth, and that there would be understanding. And when there's understanding, then there's the ability to live as he has called you to live in the earth. I pray that there would be a strong desire and a burning within your heart to pursue God like never before. To seek his face. And Isaiah 61 said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim freedom to those that were captive. You might be sitting here this morning and there might be some captivity. You, you, you haven't seen Jesus clearly as you should. And there's some things that have been holding you back. You may have asked Jesus into your heart. But you recognize there's some things that, that, that just hold you. But I'm telling you right now. He came to proclaim liberty to those who have been held captive. There is freedom and liberty to you. Now you may have made the steps to cry out to Jesus and ask him to, to, to be within you and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. You confessed him as your Lord and your Savior. But you still see some things that you know that just aren't right. You feel like I'm missing the mark. But I'm telling you, he will turn this around as revelation comes to you this morning. That you are free for whom the Son has set free is free indeed. This is why he was born. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the, the acceptable year of the Lord. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. To counsel those who mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. There's a spirit of praise for heaviness. Yeah. That they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he may be glorified. You are called to be trees of righteousness. But a planting of the Lord. He did the work. There wasn't anything in your ability, your own might, your own righteousness that caused you to be a tree that's planted. In it. It's him. He does the work. You just surrender. You yield. You let him work within you. Listen, this prophecy took place 700 years before Jesus came. Seven hundred years. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Seven hundred years before he came. Now again, Jesus, you can find this in Luke chapter four. In verse 18, where he began to open the book of Isaiah, 
Matter of fact, you come back up in verse 14. He came up out of the wilderness by the Spirit of God. He was led up by, out of the wilderness by the Spirit of God. He came to his own hometown. And he began to read out of the book of Isaiah, which I just read, chapter 61. And he decreed this. And he said to declare the year of the Lord's favor. And then he sat down. And all of them behold him. We're looking at him astonished. And he said today. This scripture. This hearing of the word is fulfilled in your ears. Now the magnitude and the impact of that. He was just saying that that scripture, Isaiah 61, is fulfilled right now. It's now fulfilled. But I want you to see something because out of that demonstration, that is a complete demonstration of his grace. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. What does it look like to live in this grace that he made available for each and every single one of us? And if you could get the scriptures in the overhead for me, that would be great. Out of Titus chapter 2. And we're going to basically read from Titus 2, ch- chapter 2, 11 through 14, and, tit- and then all the way through 3, 1 through 8. Because I want you to just see what he has provided for each and every single one of you. Grab a hold of this truth. Let us go deep within your heart. For the grace, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. He was speaking to Titus. But I exhort you, I exhort you to live in this and understand this and walk in this and know this. For the grace of God, it's not a big cover, it's not just a cover up to continue to live in, best, in, in, in your stuff, to be held captive. But the grace of God teaches you to say no to sin, no to ungodliness, and walk in holiness and righteousness. In every way, even in your own conduct, even in the way that you treat your parents, in the way that you treat your spouse, in the way that you treat individuals. He wants to go to the very core of our hearts because he's calling for a church that would be without spot and without wrinkle. Now, yes, we have been cleansed by the precious blood of the lamb that makes us white as snow. But we continue to walk in him while we're still in the earth. We continue to pursue him and pour over the word of God and be in prayer and in fellowship and relationship with him. To remain spotless. Now chapter 3 of Titus. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities. To obey. To be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle. Showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves 
were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. According to mercy, he saved you. According to his mercy, his great mercy. He was merciful, so therefore, that's why he showed his great mercy by sending his son Jesus. That was his great mercy that he showed you. And he showed great mercy when Jesus hung on Calvary's cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. That is his great mercy. But the moment that you asked him to be in your heart, grace empowered you to be saved because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And his grace saved you, but then also empowers you to stay in the place of his righteousness and holiness, which he gave you that you couldn't earn of your own ability or your own might. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He came that you might have to be heir of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to confirm constantly. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. You've been graced, you have been graced. To do so. He's come to set you free. He's come to heal every broken body. If you're sick in this place, then stand up on your feet, come up here, we're going to lay hands on you, and we're going to command healing in your body because the anointing destroys every yoke of bondage. Yeah. If you're sick in this place, I don't want you to, don't stay sitting if you're not, I mean, if you are, are dealing with stuff. If you're dealing with any sickness, I'm talking pain in the body, back, whatever it is. Come on up. Take them over there. No, 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 you guys come over here. Just come up, just... His grace to change you, to restore you, to renew you, to, 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 make a, to cause you to be able to make adjustments in your heart, to see even your character begin to line up with the character of Jesus. You are graced to live and walk this way. Say yes to His grace. Say yes to his grace. Yes to his ability. Say yes and yield. It's been given to you. He came to give you himself. He came to empower you. He came to give you the Holy Spirit. You have been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything. Even to the point 
where your tongue is so yielded to the Holy Spirit that you do not err in word. But we, we want to go towards this. We want to draw our hearts near to him and, 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 and fellowship with him. Amen. Grab a hold of the grace of God for your life. Grab a hold and do not let go. Receive. And this grace is only attained in the place of prayer. This grace is really only attained, yes, by faith, but it still comes by prayer. We confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and then we're saved. It's still, he, he graces us. He, he, he gives us the ability to cry out to him. Yeah. He's the one. And then we receive the grace to live. But this grace increases and grows in our life as we draw near to the Lord in prayer and in faith. For he who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There is pride that has to be brought low. And you humble yourself before him. And you get lower and lower. Because to a true prayer, a true individual, who comes to him in spirit and truth. Those are the ones. You've got to come humbly before the Lord. God's not going to answer a prideful prayer. It won't work. But come to him. There may be some things and blind spots that you can't see or recognize about yourself, but you would just humble yourself enough and say, God, expose the blind spots, reveal them, let them come down so that I can truly pray. And he's gracious. He is merciful because he's, you're his child. And he will, he will cause you to grow into him in this area. It comes through communion and union with him. It comes no other way. Coming to church isn't going to do it. Because we have... Houses full this morning all across the land. And yes, you can have an encounter. But it, it's got to go beyond the encounter, the, the encounter you have into a place of relationship with him. Yeah. That we put aside the distractions. We put aside that I do it myself. And draw on the, the grace of God. Draw on the ability of God in prayer. So that you can live this life effectively as he's designed you and created you to live. And what he will do in this time is he'll put his finger on things and what you're to do is just offer it up to him and say thank you Father for revealing that to me so that I can freely worship you so that I can freely live through Christ Jesus if you want real growth if you want real change this is the only way otherwise you're going to feel like the donkey with the carrot hung in front of him to keep him moving forward. Come on, that's good. And that is not true Christianity. That is not what he's called us to. Listen, he's not taking healing and dangling it in front of you and you're just trying to get it, chase after it, but just don't seem to grab a hold of it. No, just stop at that moment and that time when you feel like you're in that position, in that place. Get on your knees and just cry out to him and say, Father, whatever it is that's holding me back, whatever that, that, that is the blockage that's keeping me from receiving 
where my faith is weak, God, I thank you that you strengthen my faith. And just cry out to him. Humble yourself. It takes humbling yourself before him because he's not dangling that carrot of healing in front of you and just saying, ha ha, you can't have it. Or if you've been dealing with attitudes in your own heart and you're getting tired of seeing the way that you act and you just keep pressing and pressing it, but it doesn't seem to change. Get on your face and humble yourself and receive the grace that he has for you. You cannot do it in your own strength, but only through Christ Jesus. Only through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. This is what he came to give. And it came to pass in those days, according to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census took place first while um, Cornelius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by day, by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. So the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings and great joy, which will be to all people. This morning I bring to you good tidings with great joy. Jesus has brought you grace to live by. He's empowered you by his spirit. For there is, a, is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good w- will toward men so it was when the angels had gone away from them into the into heaven that the shepherds said to one another let us now go to bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the lord has made known to us and they came with haste And found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying, which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. I'm going to continue there in Luke, so let me give you a chance here to get there. And when the eight days, verse 21, were completed for them 
circumcision of the child. His name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. I just, I love that part. I love Simeon. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout. He was devout in worship unto God, in fellowship with God. Things will not be revealed to you if there is no fellowship and relationship. He fellowshiped with God, and it was revealed to him. Matter of fact, he came to the temple at that time by the Spirit of God to make sure so that he would see. The Holy Ghost, God already promised him, you're going to see the consolation. You're going to see Jesus. You're going to see the Messiah. And he was at home. Maybe he was making himself whatever kind of drink, tea of some sort. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Maybe he just woke up in the morning. The Holy Spirit, he he just, I got to get to the temple. I've got to get to the temple. It's because of his relationship, because of the fellowship that he had. Because he consecrated himself unto the Lord. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do For him, according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. This morning, you're receiving revelation. And the glory... Of your people Israel. And Joseph his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And then Simeon blessed them. And his... And said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Just give your heart to him. Don't hide anything away. Just give it. Let him do the work in your heart that needs to be done. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess. Here's another one. The daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 80 years, 84 years, who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption. She came in that instant. And fastings and prayings. She prayed. She communed. God has many things to reveal to each and every single one of us. And you can see it even through their lives. How God used Simeon. How God even used uh, um, Anna. Said that she was a prophetess. Well, she must have, she must have been prophesying. 
Well, how, how, did, how did she become that? Because she gave herself. She gave herself. And what I'm challenging you this morning is that you give yourself. You might be telling me, Pastor Jason, I've already given myself. Then give yourself some more. Give yourself. You give yourself to him. It's not just one prayer and then you're good. It's you pray, you ask Jesus in your heart, and then you walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. Give yourself. Because God wants to use you. God wants to reveal himself through you to others. Give yourself. Amen. And let God do what he desires to do in you. Commune with him. You be the man of God that he's called you to be. You will be the woman of God that he's called you to be. Whether a prophet, whether a pastor, whether a teacher, or whether just one that has been called to go work a business and see it grow and and you're funding the end time harvest whatever it is that he's called you to you do it wholeheartedly under the Lord and you let the glory of the Lord shine forth from your heart because you've given yourself because he's coming back for a church without spot and without wrinkle he's coming back for the precious fruit of the earth and we have a job to do while we're still here you have a job to do You've got a plan and a purpose for your life. I don't care if you consider yourself old. You've got something to do. Even if you get a phone book. I don't know if people get phone books anymore. (laughs) You just start going through a phone book and dialing numbers or whatever you got to do or just randomly dial numbers (laughs) and just start praying for people. (laughs) Come on, if you can't get out there and walk right now, if you're older, just pray pray for healing too. But come on. Shine the glory of God. Preach the gospel. That's what they had us do when we were doing Good News Report. We get on there and we had the phone book and we just start going, tru, 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 start making calls, just start talking to them about the love of God. Give yourself. First, give yourself to Him in prayer. Receive the instruction for what he has for you and then rise up and begin to do it and be obedient to that. Because you'll be empowered in that moment and you'll be graced to carry it out. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So, Brother Tim, I'm going to have a minister for a little bit on communion. I believe you'll be blessed this morning. But as, as he gets this ready, let's just worship God in our giving this morning. Amen? Let's worship God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only begotten son, that who should ever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his own son. He gave everything, his greatest gift, so that we could have eternal life. Amen? Amen. So when you sow, sow in faith, <coughs> sow in trust. Ask the Lord what he would have you do. Bring, what gift do you bring the king? Ask yourself, what gift do you bring the king? 
We know the wise men, and I'm not going to say three because it it's not clear about whether it's three. They just assume it's three because they talked of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There could have been more wise men than that. They just could have brought a lot of gold, a lot of frankincense, and a lot of myrrh. Yeah. But it funded, it funded when Joseph and Mary and, and they took Jesus to escape to Egypt. And it funded them while they were in Egypt. Amen? Now we give for another purpose. He says, for where your treasure is, your heart is also. So when we give, we're given unto the Lord. But we give into the storehouse. And what's the storehouse? The storehouse is the ministry, the church that you attend. He says, bring all your tithes into the storehouse. And so when you sow, you're bringing your supply, your giving into the storehouse. And from there, we're able to be a blessing. Amen? Amen. And that he'll make sure that you will not do without Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that as each one sows, that the devourer is rebuked in the name of Jesus. That, Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, you, and we worship you with our gifts this morning. And we thank you for the increase in the lives of each and every one. I pray for just a Mack truck blessing just to run them over in Jesus' name. That they are even rising up to be a greater blessing in, in realms of blessing others, helping feed the poor, everything that we would, we would set our hands to, Father God. Lord, it's blessed. It's blessed. You provide everything that we have need of, whether we need a building for the church, whether we need uh, um, uh, finances and different things to carry out outreaches and to do large events. Lord, everything is taken care of. In Jesus' name, we honor you and we give you all the glory. Thank you for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Brother, thank you, Jesus. Good morning. Well, Pastor asked me to speak on communion, and this might be a little bit different because I've never heard it before. Um, <laughs> so it's it might be a little intense for some and to some it's like yeah that's what I'm talking about um, pastor just mentioned about the, the, the wise men bringing you know gifts before the king because that's proper protocol you know when and the king is just one that's in authority right and so when you present yourself to the king you bring gifts and, I, and during worship, I was just thinking about this. It's like, well, Jesus presented himself before the ultimate authority, and what he bring is a gift. He brought his own blood. So when we're talking value, I can't imagine that he would have brought anything less valuable than the most valuable thing before his father. There is nothing more precious than the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Whew, hallelujah. So we're going to, ever since he said this, I had this, this phrase just running through my mind, and it's found in Luke 22. We're not going to go there just yet. Um, when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples having the last Passover meal before he was crucified. And so I just wanted to back up real quick basically all the way to Abraham. <laughs> and God spoke to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. And he says, and your descendants are going to be blessed after you. But your descendants are going to go into a nation, and they're going to be enslaved. And after 400 years, I'm going to bring them out with my strong right, right arm, and I'm going to judge that nation. 
to whom they, they were in bondage. And on the night before God led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt under Pharaoh, he instituted a he instituted an ordinance that was to be carried on throughout the entire generations of the Israelites, a perpetual ordinance of Passover. And so, as many of you know, they killed the lamb, they put the, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, and then the destroying angel would come through, and anybody that it saw the blood would, would pass over this. And so, fast forward a millennia, and we come to that night that before Jesus was arrested and the mock trial and then ultimately crucified. And in Luke 22, starting at verse 15, he said these words. He said, or I'll start in 14. He says, when the hour had come, he sat down, and the 12 apostles were with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And that phrase just kept rolling over and over and over in my mind. With this fervent desire, I have so longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And I'm like, okay, Jesus, where's the intensity here? Now we see Politically, what was happening is he was ticking a bunch of people off because he was shining the light right in their face. He was saying, I am the slight of the world. And like, no, you're a devil. And he says, come here, stretch out your hand, healed him instantly. Oh, by the way, Lazarus, dead four days. <laughs> the biggest setup in all of history. You talk about God setting up pins and Jesus knocking them down. Hey, Lazarus is dead. Good. Let's wait a couple days. He says, I was glad for your sakes that we didn't go when he was still alive because now you're going to really see the glory of God. And, and the religious institution was so enraged that this Sabbath breaker would dare to tell them that they're of the devil and that he's from God. And the fury, the fury of, of the system was so against him. And so there was this intense persecution coming to a head. It wasn't just like, hey, let's go up to this room and eat. I mean, it was, it was intense. But now we have to really back up and say, who is this guy? Who is this Jesus that looked at his followers that had just forsaken everything and just followed this guy anywhere he went for three years, hanging on every word, being in amazement at what he was doing? Who is this guy that men would just lay down everything to follow him? He is exactly what Pastor was saying. He's the child that was given. He was the son that was given, the child that was born. He came from heaven. He says, I'm from above. He was God manifested in the flesh. And God said to these men, I have been longing for this day. I have been waiting for this day to eat this meal with you. I, I have been longing earnestly to sit down. And here it is. And he took the bread. And he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, I'm going to finally reveal to you what this thousand-year-old ordinance is all about. This is my body, which is broken for you. This isn't just some, okay, we're getting out of Egypt. No, we're getting out of sin's domain. This is my body, my body, that the body that in Hebrew said, a body you have prepared for me to do your will, O Lord. You don't, and you're not interested in all the sacrifices and offerings. You want your will to be performed. When Jesus was hanging on that cross and he said, it is finished, it was the will of God for man that was completely done in that man. Yeah. Hallelujah. That God man, God redeemed us. Just He didn't pick some Joe. God came down. He says, I will provide for myself an arm of salvation. Amen? Yeah. 
And he said, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the, everybody say it, new covenant in my blood which is shed for you so he said this is my body which is given for you this is my blood which is shed for you both instances what do you mean saying i'm doing this for you you're the one that's going to get the benefit from me doing this i'm not doing this for me this has nothing to do with me this is me fulfilling the father's will which is i want my people i want them with me it is the absolute desire of God to have his creation come on back unto him. And he said, this is, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And then we go over to Hebrews chapter 8, starting in verse 8. And oh, I should probably get there myself. 8 through 12. And the writer of Hebrews is just laying out this huge case from beginning to end on who Jesus is. It, it's a fantastic book. If you've never read Hebrews, it's my absolute favorite book in the Bible. And he said this starting in verse 8. Again, I should probably get there. <laughs> it totally went out of order. That's hilarious. Selah, stop, pause, think about this while I find my place. <laughs> In Hebrews chapter 8, it says this. I'll start in verse 7 again. For if that first covenant, now re remember Jesus said this is the blood of the new covenant, right? Now, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second covenant the second covenant is the new covenant. The first covenant is the old covenant. This book is divided in two parts, the, f the old and the new covenant of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? He says, but finding fault with them, the people that couldn't keep that first covenant, he said, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. Now, this is Jeremiah saying this. Again, during the Babylonian captivity of, of Israel. Again, about 500 years before Jesus ever showed up. Before the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Why? Because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant this is the covenant that Jesus' blood ratified for us that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God. He just is our God. And that's why, you know, it, it, it's, it's when people say you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. It's not exactly true because Jesus already is the Lord of your life. You just need to acknowledge it. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. He's the king. He is the king. I mean, you can say, hey, not my, not my king, but he's, he's your king. You know, just like people say, not my president, still the president. You know, Jesus is. Jesus is Lord. And when we align ourselves to that truth that's when the blessing comes that's when he becomes my savior when when i align myself to his lordship then then the saving then the saving hits amen it's when we want to do things our own way and still have him in our back pocket that's when it doesn't work it doesn't work god god's not mocked he he, he knows your game he knows my game you know it's 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 he's like like it's been said he's either lord of all or not at all amen and we're gonna we're gonna kind of <laughs> kind of get into this in just very shortly okay where did i let off, left off and they and they sh and i will be their god and they shall be my people none of them shall teach his neighbor none his brother saying know the lord be intimately acquainted with the lord for all shall know me why from the least of them to the greatest for i will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds i will 
That's a promise. That's a decision. I will remember no more. See, our problem, our problem isn't I can't. That's not your problem. Our problem is I won't. It's always an I, I won't because God can cover the I can't. He, he can fill in where we can't, he can. But if we won't, then he can't. It's not I can't, it's I won't. It's all a matter, again, of positioning our will with him. Will we do the will of the Father? Jesus came to do the will of the Father, and that's the gauntlet that's been passed on to us. Now, will we take up the torch and continue the will of the Father? Because Jesus came, gave us <laughs> the Holy Spirit to continue the work of what? Evangelizing the world, to have shining the light of the gospel. Until what? Until every creature under heaven has heard the good news and has a choice and has, a, has an opportunity to do the I will part, not the I can't. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. And so wrapping this up in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul, who I think had a pretty good clue as to what was going on. I mean, you know, he saw the Lord, <laughs> personally taught by him for several years, uh, had incredible insight into the workings of the Holy Spirit and how the church is formed, said these words in 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 16. He said this. He said, this cup of blessing which we bless. Okay, he's talking about the, the communion meal at this point. This cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So what's he saying? What's this, what's this communion thing here? I believe, I believe it's koinonia. It's this intimate fellowship that, that speaks of unity. When we partake of this, this covenant meal, which we're about to partake of, he said there's, there's a joining, there's a, there's a together. It's the body and the blood of Christ. It's, it's symbolized by, you know, bread and, and, and wine, but there's a... There's a spiritual element to it because God's a faith God, amen? When we take things in faith, God gets involved. You know, it's not like we're just going to, you know, I'm going to stand here with, 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 with bread and you're just going to come up and I'm going to say, you know, God bless you, next, God bless you, next. There's, there's an element of I'm partaking. I know the Lord. I have a relationship with the Lord. And I would encourage you, if you have no intention of serving the Lord today, you do not have to participate in this. In fact, and we'll say it like this. No, well, I'll just finish. I'll finish what I'm reading, then I'll, <laughs> I'll say it like this. I'm sorry, verse 10 and then verse 16. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Why? For we, for we, though many, are one bread. We are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So in us partaking of that bread, we partake with one another. So you're kind of, we kind of marry into a pretty big family here. <laughs> so this is the thing that just really kind of hit me. He said, I will no longer, I believe this is back in Luke, and it might even be in Mark. He says, I will no longer drink of, eat of this bread and drink of the cup until I drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. So I kind of looked at that for a minute. I'm like, okay, what are you saying? This is the last Passover. I've been so eager to, to have this with you. And now I'm going away. And in, and in the book of John, he just goes into, I'm going back to my Father. You're going to be one. We're coming with you. The Spirit's going to unify my body. He says, and I'm going away 
to prepare a place for you and then I'm coming back to receive you unto myself so that where I am, you may be also. I'm preparing this place for you. And it speaks of a marriage covenant. The bridegroom has left and he's preparing the place for his bride to come. <laughs> I want to make sure I just don't get ahead of myself on this. He said, I'm not going to eat this meal with you again until I eat it anew in my Father's kingdom. This Passover meal that speaks of the blood of Christ redeeming us and atoning for our sin, it's not going to be the same meal when we get to heaven. It's going to be the wedding feast of the Lamb. When we eat it again with Jesus, when we are in our glorified bodies and we're all together and we're eating this meal, it will be the consummation meal of our, our full union with Christ in the wedding. It'll be a wedding feast. He says, I can't wait to have this meal so I can open this up to you so that you can see that every time you take this, you're looking forward to that day when I come back and that we're all together forever, never more separation, no more death, no more pain, no more suffering. And we're all glorified and we're all unified. So to say it like this, to, to phrase what Jesus said, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this meal with you before I suffer. My blood will be shed for the remission of your sins. My body will suffer God's wrath and taste death on your behalf. And I will send the Holy Spirit to gather all the redeemed ones together into one body, my body. The next time we share this meal, we'll be at the wedding feast in heaven well, we, when we will come together and be united forever. <laughs> so, so, if the next time we eat this with him is at the wedding, what is it now but an engagement ring? If we partake of this, it's not I can't, it's I will. It's not I won't. If we're not willing to say, Jesus, I give myself to you fully as my husband. That's what this is all about. It's a promise until we have the consummation. He is not going to violate God by, you know, consummating prior to, to the wedding. Amen. He's longing for that day when we are truly one. So when we take this, when we take this communion meal with our Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, we're saying, I am betrothed to you and I will remain faithful to you until you come and we're lawfully wed <laughs> at at the resurrection. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, it's important that we don't do this lightheartedly, but it's joyfully. It's amazing. If our hearts have said, I will and I do, then what is it? It's, it's love. You can't wait to get with the one. Now, if it's an arranged marriage and you don't know the guy and you think he's kind of underhanded, it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm dreading this. But no, this is the one who has wooed you with his goodness. He's the one that's good to you. Amen? He's the one that's good to you. So if you don't know, <laughs> if you don't know this king who's coming, and I, and I mean honestly, if you just don't know, but you want to, I invite you right now. <laughs> Just lift up your hand and open your heart. 
and let the king come in. Because he's been preparing heaven for this very thing for 2,000 years. He's been working on a place that is perfectly suited for you. But it can't be on our terms. He's the boss. He's the Lord. He's the king. But his promise is wide open. Is there anyone that can say, I've been living in the I won't all this time, and I want to change that I won't to an I will. Is there anyone that can say that? I see that hand. Is there anyone? Anyone else? This is, this is our greatest privilege. This is our greatest privilege to offer you the chance to begin a relationship with God that is that the whole foundation of it is love. It's not manipulation. It's not, it's not servitude. It's a love relationship that is based on respect and honor. Honor the Lord this morning, and he will honor you. Well, if you've raised your hand or if you didn't and you wanted to raise your hand, I just want to lead you in a, in a quick prayer be t- before we take communion because more than anything, we want you to take communion with us. We want you to have fellowship with us as the body of Christ. Now, we're just, we're just one little body. But when you receive Christ... <laughs> You have just stepped into the biggest family on the planet. The body of Christ knows no language barriers. It knows no topographical boundaries. The body of Christ is everywhere. It's everywhere. And you have a family anywhere you go. You have a family. You have a family in Christ. You just don't have a Savior, which is amazing, but you have a family because we're all connected. We're all connected. So let's pray this prayer. If you've, if you've never surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ or if you've been unfaithful to Jesus and you want to confess and renew those vows, let's just say this, Father, I come before you in all lowliness and humility. And I recognize my need for you. You sent your son into this world to atone for my sin, to cover my sin. And he did that on the cross. Father, you raised him from the dead. And now he's seated with you in heaven. You are going to send him back one day. And I want to be ready for that day. So, Father, forgive me. Cleanse me of my sins. Wash me with the blood of Christ. And fill me with your precious Holy Spirit. (laughs) Father, I receive him as my husband, as my king, as my Lord. Hallelujah. (laughs) Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. (laughs) Okay. All right. So, hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer from your heart, you're right with God. You're right with God. There's nothing you can do to get right with God other than surrender. And acknowledge. Amen. Amen.
We acknowledge him. We acknowledge him. You know, you might look out and you see people like, man, they're just way up there, you know, and it's like, no, we all start at the same spot. We all go through this same door. It's just that other have been wa- others have been walking with him for a while, and, and he's taught them and instructed them. Trust me, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jesus. <laughs> I probably wouldn't even be alive because I was, I was an idiot. But he fathered me. On that, on that day, on that day in June in 1986, I, I waved the white flag of surrender. I mean, that was my prayer to become a Christian. I surrender. I, I give up. <laughs> I'm, done, I'm done fighting. I'm done running. And he changed me. He fathered me. He taught me. He took this and, and, and burned it into my heart. And this thing has been leading me and guiding me all these years. And to the degree that I would yield to it, Determine the degree of my success. <laughs> Amen. So. Okay. So we, we invite you. We encourage you. Let's, let's take this communion. Um, we can.